welcome to Dharma Sutra Meditation Center this evening by TV Morenzi, who will be giving the evening Dharma talk on June the 16th, 2012. And the number for it is the Majima Nikaya number 59, the Bahu Vedaniya Sutta, the many kinds of feelings. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pandika's Park. Then the carpenter Panjakanga went to the venerable Udayan, after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and asked him, Venerable, venerable Sir, how many kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One? Three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One Householder. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neither painful nor pleasant feeling. These three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One. Now you'll notice it's not talking about emotional feeling. It's just talking about feeling itself. Not three kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, Venerable Udayan. Two kinds of feeling have been stated by the Blessed One, pleasant and painful feeling. This neither painful nor pleasant feeling has been stated by the Blessed One as a peaceful and sublime kind of pleasure. A second time and a third time, the Venerable Udayan stated his position. A second and a third time, the, the carpenter Panchakanga stated his. The Venerable Udayan could not convince the carpenter Panchakanga, nor could the carpenter Panchakanga convince Venerable Udayan. The Venerable Ananda heard their conversation. Then he went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him. He sat down at one side and reported to the Blessed One the entire conversation between the Venerable Udayan and the Carpenter Panjakanga. When he finished, the Blessed One told the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, it is actually true. It is actually a true presentation that the Carpenter Panjakanga could not accept from Udayan. And it was actually a true presentation that Udayan would not accept from the carpenter Panjakanga. I have stated two kinds of feeling in one presentation. I have stated three kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated five kinds of feeling in another presentation. Now, the five kind just breaks it up a little bit more. In Pali, it's Sukha, Dukkha, Domanasa, Somanasa, uh, Somanasa, Domanasa, and Upeka. What that means is you have a pleasant physical feeling, you have a painful physical feeling, you have a pleasant mental feeling, you have a painful mental feeling, and you have equanimity. So that's the five kinds of feeling. Okay? <coughs> I have stated six kinds of feeling in another presentation. Now this is all of the sense doors. The eyes, the ears, the tongue, the nose, the body, and mind. Now this is the, the kind of feeling that I was talking with you about this morning. When that consciousness arises, there is a feeling that's either a pleasant feeling or painful feeling. And right after that, tightness happens in your mind. And right after that, thoughts arise. And then your habitual tendency of, I always think of it in this way. So, in order to see, you have to have a good working eye. There has to be color and form. The good working eye hits the color and form, eye consciousness arises. 
The meeting of these three things is called eye contact. With eye contact as condition. Don't sit with your legs crossed, please. Sorry. With eye contact as condition, eye feeling arises. Eye feeling is pleasant. If it's a pleasant sight, painful. If it's an unpleasant sight, or neither painful nor pleasant. With I feeling as condition, I craving arises. What is craving? Every time a feeling arises in your mind, there occurs right after that feeling arising a tightness that happens in your brain. This is how you recognize craving when it arises. Okay, now physically, there is a membrane that goes around your brain. It's called the meninges. And it contracts every time a feeling arises, when craving arises. With craving as condition, clinging arises. What is clinging? All of your thoughts, all of your opinions, all of your ideas, all of your concepts, all of your story about why you like or dislike that feeling. And this is where you really start identifying with that feeling and those thoughts. You start taking them personally. This is my thought. This is my idea. This is who I am. Okay, craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. If it's a pleasant feeling, I like it. If it's a painful feeling, I don't like it. Now this, this happens really fast. So then there is this tightness in your head and now you have thoughts. And you have a habitual tendency when this kind of feeling comes up, these kind of thoughts arise, I always act that way. For instance, depression is a big deal. It's a big thing right now. A lot of people are getting very depressed for any number of reasons. How does depression arise? What happens first? A painful feeling arises. I don't like it. I start thinking about it and I start saying, this is my depression, this is who I am right now. And then your habitual tendency arises. Now you're made up of five different things. You have a physical body, you have feeling, pleasant, painful, neither pleasant nor painful. You have perception. Perception is a part of your mind that names things. It comes up with concepts. You look at this and you say, this is a book. Perception is a part of your mind that named that. Okay? Then you have thoughts and then you have consciousness. Now, when a painful feeling arises, our tendency is to try to think the feeling away. But thoughts are one thing. And feeling is something else. And the more you try to control the feeling with your thoughts, the bigger and more intense that feeling becomes. <coughs> so, what can we do? when that painful feeling arises. What can we do about it? We have to realize that you didn't all of a sudden make up your mind. 
you know, I haven't been depressed for a few days, I might as well be depressed now. It came up because the conditions were right for it to arise. Now the tricky part of this is, it isn't yours, it's just a feeling. That's why I told you to laugh. Because you go from, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. I'm depressed and I don't like it. And when you laugh, it goes to, oh, it's only this depression. Ah, let it go. So it goes from being very personal. And when it's personal, there's craving in your mind. And when there's craving in your mind, that is the cause of suffering. So when you laugh, you relax. And when you relax, it changes your perspective. From I'm depressed to it's only depression. So you can let it go. So understanding how feeling arises is, um, takes practice takes practice in sitting. Sometimes you'll be able to recognize when a feeling arises, sometimes you won't. Sometimes you can recognize when craving arises, sometimes you don't. You get caught up in your thoughts about it, you don't recognize it for a period of time. Or your habitual tendency of trying to control your feeling with your thoughts. But when you're learning how to meditate and you stay with your spiritual friend, you'll be able to see more clearly how this process works. Okay? And as you see how this works, that's when you start practicing the six R's. You recognize when the distraction is there, you release the distraction. That means don't keep your attention on those thoughts and feelings. They're only thoughts and feelings. They're not yours. And the more you feed that with your thoughts and your mind, the bigger and more intense it becomes, the more you suffer. So you let that feeling, you let those thoughts be there by themselves. You don't keep your attention on them. You don't try to push them away. You don't try to stop them. You just don't keep your attention on it. Now you relax that tension and tightness in your head. Now I was saying that every time craving arises, there's this tension and tightness. So when you relax, you'll feel kind of an expansion that happens in your head. And you'll notice something real interesting right after that. You don't have any thoughts. You have this very pure mind. You have this mind that's very alert. Now you bring up something wholesome. Smile. We call it re-smile, just to keep it in with the R's. And then you return to your object of meditation. And you repeat staying with your object of meditation for as long as you can. That's the six R's. Now the six R's are not individual things to be done. <coughs> They're a flow. So when you notice that you have a distraction, your mind's pulled away, you let it be relaxed, or you recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. So it's kind of a flow, it's like rolling your arms. So you don't do each one individually. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> And you don't label them. 
But I'll tell you about everybody that uh, that starts practicing. They do, they do that for a little while till they get used to it. Then you start noticing you do it much faster when you don't get the verbalization in the way. So, <coughs> when you let go of craving, your mind is bright, your mind is alert, and your mind is pure. So you bring that pure, smiling mind back to your object of meditation. So what you're really doing is, and you'll get distracted again, if it's a strong attachment, you'll go back and do it again. Okay, fine. What you're doing is you're starting to teach yourself how this process works. Feeling, how co there's contact, there's feeling, there's craving, there's clinging, there's habitual tendency, birth of action, and suffering. That's how it works. So, repetition is something that's very much needed. You have to do it over and over and over again as you become familiar with it it gets easier to recognize and to let it go. It's just like anything. I mean, Tiger Woods didn't get to be a great golfer just by picking up a club and swinging it. He had to swing it a lot of times in a lot of different situations. And he had to continually work with that over and over and over until he got good at it. And even when he's really good at it, sometimes the ball doesn't go where he wants it to go. So the thing with these six kinds of feeling is being able to recognize when that feeling arises. And it's not easy to recognize, not at first. You feel like there's so many different things that you have to do when you're, when you're sitting with your meditation. I haven't got time to look at this stuff closer. As your mind starts to settle down, as you start to stay with your object of meditation for a longer period of time, it gets much easier to recognize how this process works. Now, uh, a couple of days ago, I gave you a talk on the hindrances. And I told you over and over again, they're not enemies to fight with. It's just a distraction. You have to expect distractions to happen. You're not going to be perfect at sitting with having a mind quiet. Because you're not used to it. But as you become more familiar with it, it gets easier and easier. And eventually you'll start seeing more subtle little things happen right before you got taken away. And then you start zigzagging then. So you start, at first you're not on your object of, of meditation very much at all, 10, 15 seconds before your mind takes off. But you use the six R's and come back. You don't criticize yourself because you think you're supposed to be better than you are. You let go of all expectations of what you think meditation is. And just use the six R's and come back to your object of meditation. And then you fly away again. And it might be a minute or two minutes before you go, oh, I forgot. But as you do it over and over again, that starts improving your mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. It's remembering to observe. So the whole thing is, as you become more familiar with how your mind runs away, 
you start catching it a little bit quicker and then you start staying with your object of meditation for a little bit longer okay now you start to gain some moment some momentum and instead of being trapped by your thoughts and feelings and all of this other stuff for two minutes then it cuts down to a minute and a half then it's a minute and then it's 50 seconds and then it's 30 seconds but the length of time that you start staying with your object of meditation it goes from 15 seconds to 30 seconds to a minute to a couple minutes as you become familiar with this process now every distraction that pulls your attention away from your object of meditation is called a hindrance the hindrances are your teacher the hindrances are telling you where your attachment is what is attachment these are the thoughts and feelings that arise that I take personally. What causes a hindrance to arise? Past action. Every morning I have you reciting the precepts. Now that's, this is not a, an empty rite and ritual. Okay, I undertake to keep the precept to abstain from killing or harming living beings on purpose. I undertake to keep the precept to abstain from taking what is not given. I undertake to keep the precept to abstain from all sexual activity because you're on retreat, but when you take the five precepts, it's wrong sexual activity. I undertake to keep the precept to abstain from telling lies, using harsh speech, that's cursing, which a lot of the young people, they, that's just their way of talking now. They don't consider it cursing or offensive language, but it is. No slander, trying to divide this group from this group. No gossip. What is gossip? Gossip is making up stories that aren't true and telling it like it is true. No taking drugs and alcohol. Doesn't mean you don't take medicine. You can. It means you don't have a beer just to take the edge off. Because that dulls your mind. And you have a tendency to break one of the other four precepts after your mind gets a little bit loose. So keeping the precepts is a real important part of the practice and it's an all the time practice. Why does a hindrance arise? Because in the past you broke a precept. Now you have to work with that until you can purify that and it will go away by itself. So, <clears throat> hindrances will arise, and it's, you broke a precept in the past, do you know which one it was, did you, do you know what you did? Not necessarily, it's just a hindrance right now. So you let the hindrance be, and you relax and smile, and you come back to your object of meditation. As you do that over and over again, and don't feed that hindrance with your attention, it starts to get weaker because there's nothing pushing against it now because you're not paying attention to it. So it starts to get weaker and weaker and weaker and then finally it fades away. When it fades away, you have an immediately immediate sense of relief. Right after that, joy arises. Now, the kind of joy I'm talking about is the uplifting joy. You feel really light in your mind. 
and there's a lot of excitement. Hey, this is good stuff. I ought to be doing this more. And you feel light in your body. When the joy fades away, you will feel very comfortable and very tranquil. And this is what the Buddha called happiness. And right after that, your mind just stays on your object of meditation without much problem at all. Now, I just described the first jhana, and we'll get into that again in a minute. Okay, I have stated 18 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I have stated 36 kinds of feeling in another presentation. I've stated 108 kinds of feeling in another presentation. That is how the Dhamma has been shown by me in different presentations. When the Dhamma has thus been shown by me in different presentations, it may be expected of those who will not concede, allow, and accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will be quarreling, brawling, disputing, and stabbing each other with verbal daggers. It may be expected of those who concede, allow, accept what is well stated and well spoken by others, that they will live in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, blending like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. Now what this is really referring to is your attachment to ideas. Well, I heard him say there's three kinds of feeling. Well, I heard him say there was two. And I, you're wrong, I'm right. So it's letting go of that and just saying, okay, we'll see. This is what's happening a lot in the world right now. I have an opinion of the way the world really is and I'm going to hold on to that and I'll even go to war just to prove that I'm right and you're wrong. So that kind of goes a little bit against what the Buddha's teaching is. It's to be accepting. You have that opinion? You can have your opinion. That's fine. I don't have to accept it. But you have the right to have whatever you want. And we can still be happy. That's the attitude that the Buddha was continually trying to teach people over and over and over again. Ananda, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Odors cognizable by the nose that are wished for desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Flavors cognizable by the tongue that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. Should anyone say that this is the utmost joy 
and pleasure that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? Because there's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure? Here Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. What are unwholesome states? Hindrances, anything that pulls your attention away. A person enters upon and abides in the first jhana. Jhana is a Pali word that is very much misinterpreted by almost everyone. They interpret jhana as meaning concentration. Jhana means a level of your understanding. which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So when you sit and you get into this very peaceful, calm, alert state, You had to work to get there. And the work is noticing every time your mind is distracted, using the six R's and coming back. When, while you are in this jhana, no disturbances will bother you. No hindrances will arise. Your mind is pure. You're very alert. You'll be able to sit for a few minutes and experience this. And then your mindfulness gets weak for whatever reason. Then you have another hindrance come up. Now you have to work with this hindrance. And it's kind of funny because everybody, especially when they get into the first jhana, they get up and they do their walking and you do do walking. And then they, they say, well, I'm going to go sit and get into that state and do that some more. It was really good. And with that expectation, you put in too much energy to try to get to it, and it, that state doesn't come. So you put more energy into it, and your mind gets restless. And you think, well, this isn't working, so you put more energy into it, and your mind gets more restless. And then you come crying to me, and saying, I had such a good sitting and that was so lousy. Right after that, what do I say? You're trying too hard. You're expecting the meditation to be like it was. And you're putting too much energy into it. So, back off. You don't need more energy, you need less. <clears throat> Should anyone say that is the utmost pleasure and joy that beings experience, I would not concede that to him. Why is that? There's another kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the, that pleasure. And what is that other kind of pleasure here, Ananda? With the stilling of thinking and examining thought. A monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and stillness of mind without thinking and examining thought, with joy and happiness born of collectedness. 
This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. So you had this hindrance and it was there and now you're starting to get the idea of how to let it go. And because of that, you start to feel more confident. I, I really feel like I know what I'm doing now. And you start to get a little bit more enthusiastic. Now, you don't have any discursive thinking at all when you're in this jhana. This is where noble silence dwells in the second jhana. If you try to make a wish for, or verbalize a wish for your spiritual friend, start to get a headache. So you have to let go of the verbalization in your mind. Now you feel the wish and put that feeling in your heart and radiate it to your spiritual friend. You don't verbalize it all. When you do that, the joy you experience is much stronger and you feel much lighter in your mind and in your body. The difference between joy and happiness, say you're in the desert and you haven't had any water for a long time and you see an oasis. Just seeing that oasis, your mind becomes happy. Now I can go get a drink. And there's some excitement in it, right? And the closer you get, the happier you feel. Oh, I'm finally going to get rid of this dry taste. And you go up to this little pool of water. And you jump in the water. And the water is exactly the right temperature. And your mind goes, ah. Oh. And your body goes, ah. Oh. That's happiness. Okay? So the joy has some excitement in it. It's not as stable as it could be. But the happiness is just like a placid lake. Just peaceful, calm. Very comfortable. When the, when the joy arises in the second jhana, you actually feel like you're floating. I've had some students say, oh, I'm, I am floating. I think I'm going to hit the ceiling. So they open up their eyes and see they're sitting on the ground <laughs> or in a chair, whatever. Okay, this is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous pleasure. Should anyone say that this is the highest and best sublime state? I would not agree with that. What is the other pleasure that's higher and loftier than the previous pleasure? Here, Ananda, with the fading away of joy, a monk abides in equanimity, mindful, fully aware, still feeling happiness with the body. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on the count of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. This is the other kind of pleasure, loftier and sublime, more sublime than the previous. So when you get into the third jhana, what happens is you don't feel any more joy. You feel really comfortable in your mind and in your body. And you have this balance of mind. Now you're still going to hear things, you're still going to have to feel ants coming across or somebody with a, a motorcycle comes by you're going to hear it but it doesn't make your mind shake you'll know it happened you'll know it was there but just okay fine that's what equanimity is all about this is a time when uh, 
quite often meditators come and they start complaining because they don't have any more joy. Because it's real easy to get hooked on the joy. It's a nice feeling. It's a, and the excitement is real good. But now your mind is peaceful, calm. As you lose tension in your mind, you lose tension in your body. And when you lose tension in your body, you're not going to feel parts of it. You're going to say, I'm sitting and I, I don't feel my hands. My leg went away. I don't feel my shoulder. This is natural. As you let go of tension in your mind, you let go of tension in your body. When you let go of tension in your body, all of those tight places in your body start relaxing. So the blood circulation is a little bit better. And you feel very, very comfortable. Should anyone say this is the highest and loftiest uh, state, I would not agree with him. And what other kind of pleasure is better than the previous? Here, Ananda, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a person enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. When you get to the fourth jhana, you're not going to be able to feel the radiation in your heart anymore. That feeling is going to come up into your head. And you're not going to feel anything in your body unless there's contact. If I come up and touch you, you would feel it. But your mind has such strong balance in it. You know it happened, but so what? It doesn't shake. And this is when I will start giving you some other instructions in the meditation, but not until then. When you get to the fourth jhana, you actually become an advanced meditator. Now, most people in the world are practicing a different kind of meditation than what I'm teaching you. And to get to the fourth jhana can take years, the way they practice. Uh, if you follow the directions the way I'm showing you, um, it can take seven or eight days. Well, when I was in Thailand, they said, you get to the fourth jhana, 15 years. That's how long you have to practice before you can do it. In, in Sri Lanka, 10 years. Practice what the Buddha is showing us here, a week, sometimes faster. It's because they're practicing a different kind of meditation. They're practicing one-pointed concentration. What is one-pointed concentration? Your mind is on your object of meditation and it gets distracted. The instructions are immediately let go of that distraction and come back to your object of meditation. The force of the concentration becomes so strong that it suppresses the hindrances, which you think is a good thing at the time. But when you lose that concentration and you go back out into your daily life, there's no personality development. The hindrances come in your daily life just like they always did. 
you get just as mad or madder when somebody says something or does something you don't like because you're not able to recognize how the process works because of the force of the concentration. Now, when you're practicing what the Buddha is teaching, your mind is on your object of meditation, same. Your mind gets distracted, same. You let go of the distraction, same. Now you relax that tension and tightness in your head and smile and come back to your object to meditation. Now what's the difference between the two? One of them brought craving back and one of them didn't. And when you don't bring the craving back to your object to meditation, your progress is very fast. That's just the way it works. I've given two-week retreats that there were so many people that were so close to attaining Nibbana, it was shocking. And that's in two weeks. And they're just talking about getting to a few jhanas, taking years. One of the things when the, when the Buddha talks about the Dhamma, the, the way that things are, he says that this is immediately effective. Immediately effective means pretty quick. But these other people, they're going years. No, I, I had 20 years of straight vipassana. I understand what that practice does. It took me five years to figure out what the meditation wasn't before I started out, just started to figure out what it was. Five years. Not so good. Not what I would call immediately effective. So when you get to the fourth jhana, now you have become an advanced meditator and you're able to start to see how the feeling, when the feeling arises and how mind starts to tighten around it and you'll be able to ra relax more quickly and more easily. So when you're, when you're first starting out with your meditation, your mind is flip-flopping. And as you go deeper in your meditation, it stops moving quite so much. When you get to the fourth jhana, now it's starting to vibrate and you're seeing the difference. You're starting to see and you're teaching yourself how this process works. <coughs> Should anyone say this is the highest pleasure, I would not concede that to him. And what is another kind of pleasure here, Ananda? With the complete surmounting of gross perceptions of forms. With the disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact. Aware that space is infinite. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. Now what are we talking about here? when you're practicing loving-kindness meditation. You'll be able to sit for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes without having any distraction in your mind. And then you'll notice that the feeling of loving-kindness change. It changed into something else. And what happens is naturally your mind develops compassion. And with that you will feel an expansion happening in your mind. And in all directions at the same time, it just keeps going out and out and out and out and out. And there's no, li no limit to it, it just keeps getting bigger. And that's what they call infinite space. You don't feel your body. 
unless there's contact. You would still hear a sound, but you have such strong equanimity in your mind, it doesn't really distract you at all. But you can hear it. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous. Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. Now, when you get to infinite consciousness, things change again. The feeling of compassion changes into a feeling of joy. And you don't feel expansion, but now you're starting to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away, arise and pass away, arise and pass away. That was a hundred thousand or so. Okay, but you're going to hear, you're going to see individual consciousnesses. And it's like watching a movie, but it's going a little bit too slow. And you're going to see the picture and it's off, and the picture and off, picture and off. And that happens at every one of the sense doors. So that's, you're seeing a really, truly amazing thing. And you're seeing that everything is in a state of change. It's there and then it disappears. It's there and it disappears. It's there and it disappears. So you're seeing everything is impermanent. And because it's always changing like that, it's a form of suffering. Because we're all looking for something that's permanent. And now, because you're seeing how this happens, you're seeing there is no controller. There's no me, there's no my, there's no I in that. It's happening by itself. There's only the observation of how this process happens. It's quite interesting. And the joy you experience is not the same kind of joy you experienced in the lower jhanas. This is a happy feeling, not so much excitement in it. And when you get to that state, then I'll tell you, I want you to look at what happens in between each of those consciousnesses arising and passing away. And tell me what that is. And uh, here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. Now the feeling of joy will fade away and very strong equanimity occurs. And it's real easy for me to tell when you have that kind of equanimity because you come in and talk to me and I say, well, how's it going? Fine. Everything is fine. See anything exciting? No, everything is fine. It's just perfect. What happens now is mind is not looking outside of itself. Now you're starting to see much more subtle, little tiny things that can arise in mind. Now the whole time that you're learning how to meditate, you're learning how to balance your energy so you can stay with your meditation. When you get to this state, this is like doing a tightrope on a, a spider web. A little bit too much energy in watching, you get restless. Not quite enough, you get dull. 
So you have to learn how to tweak your energy and your attention so that you have perfect balance. And there's all kinds of, this is probably the most interesting state of mind or the state to experience in all meditation. It's really interesting. And there's nothing. <laughs> but now you start to sit for longer periods of time and you start to see more and more subtle, tiny, little things that I won't describe to you. You have to describe it to me. You'll be able to sit for 45 minutes or an hour without having any disturbance in your mind at all. And it's still interesting. <coughs> Here, Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a person enters upon in the base of neither perception nor non perception. So what happens is you'll get to such a subtle state of mind that you'll be sitting for a period of time and you come and you say to me, is it possible to be asleep and aware at the same time? Now before your, your mind was vibrating, as you go deeper that vibration becomes less and less and less until it's hard to tell whether it's even there or not. Now what happens is I will tell you right after that, after you come out of that state, I want you to reflect on what happened while you were in that state. And there's colors and there's different shapes and there's different things that can arise. As soon as you see that, you use the six R's. So what you're doing basically is from the first time you start meditating, you're flip-flopping, you become more and more quiet and then your mind is just vibrating and that gets to be less and less because you're relaxing more and more. until it, it's hard to tell whether there's any vibration at all. When you come out of that and you six are those shapes, you'll be able to sit for long periods of time without any disturbance in your mind at all. And if there's any kind of vibration or movement, you'll be able to see it immediately and you six hard and let it go. Now is when you start seeing the more subtle parts of the links of dependent origination. What I was telling you before about feeling and craving and clinging, action or birth and, and the suffering. Okay, those are gross. What happened before the feeling, there was contact. What happened before the contact, there was mind and body. Now this is a kind of an interesting thing that the Buddha came up with that he was the only one that came up with this because everybody else was practicing one point in concentration and they would lose their body. They didn't have any feeling arise in their body. Their mind was just stuck on one thing. But the Buddha said you can't have mind without body. They're interconnected, they're interwoven. So this is a, an insight, but you will be able to see that insight. You'll be able to see that and recognize it. And then right before that, you'll see the potential for consciousness. Now these disturbances, these vibrations get smaller and smaller and smaller then you'll see the formations and you'll see that eventually there are no more conditions arising. 
and when you get to that that is the unconditioned state that's what the Buddha called Nibbana how do you talk about Nibbana I don't know I've been with monks that like to discuss that term but it's an unconditioned state and all we can talk about is conditioned concepts and opinions these are all conditioned how can you talk about something that's unconditioned so that's how uh, one attains Nibbana by going through all of these different states and you're teaching yourself more and more about how this process works and how to let it go and relax and more and more and more until it gets really so subtle you can't tell whether you're there or not. But when you come out, then you start six horing anything that happened while you were in there. And then you have this exquisite peace and calm. You can sit for an hour and a half, two hours, without ever having any kind of vibration or disturbance. And your equanimity is very strong. The balance of mind. <coughs> Some people say, well, what's the advantage of that? Not to have any disturbance in your mind at all means there is a lot of relief. And it's a kind of happiness. So, here Ananda, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. This is that other kind of pleasure, loftier and more sublime than the previous one. So we keep on getting subtler and subtler, and these are loftier and more sublime. And it's really true, because you, you go from having this gross mind and being able to see how this process works more and more clearly. And that's how you attain Nibbana, by understanding that this is the way the process works. And it's such a startling thing that you go into an unconditioned state and you'll be there for a while and then you come out you will be happy and you will be happy for a long time and you look out at the trees and everything is very very sharp and clear and wherever you put your attention you see the minutest details of everything and it's like before you were wearing glasses that were a little bit uh, steamy and now they're clear and you see that in everything now what's the advantage of attaining Nibbana well if you get to the first stage you never have any more doubt arise as to what is the correct path no doubt ever again you let go of the idea that rites and rituals lead to Nibbana. And the idea of a personal self fades away. No more. So that's a pretty good advantage to start out with. Now, I was telling you about the precepts. After you attain Nibbana, you will not break a precept for any reason on purpose. And that's one of the ways you test whether you really attain Nibbana. 
by saying, I'm going to say something that I know is false. And you try to say it and your mind says, nope, nope, you're not going to say that. So this is how you start purifying your mind. So there's a lot of real advantages to practice this. And the thing is, people think meditation is just while you're sitting. And all of your life is part of meditation. Watch what your mind does, how you cause your own pain. How does restlessness arise in your daily life? How does worry and anxiety come up? How do all of these things that cause suffering, how do they arise? And you start recognizing these and you start using the six R's and you start relaxing into these things and there's personality development. What you normally would have done, oh, it's okay, it's just a little thing. You won't do it anymore. You won't break a precept. Now, I know that there's a lot of people, especially in this country, that they object to, quote, morality. Because it's been pushed down their throat. And it's starting to happen in other countries, too. In Sri Lanka, the monks only talk about keeping your precepts. They don't talk about anything other than that. So when somebody comes along and they start teaching, teaching the Dhamma, they get real excited. I've always wanted to hear something other than morality. But morality is an important part of the practice. See, meditation has three parts to it. The first part of meditation is practicing your generosity. What does generosity mean? Guard your pocketbook. No. Generosity is smile and give that smile to somebody else. Say something nice. Help somebody that needs help. Practice your generosity. It means giving of yourself. Helping other people so they don't have to suffer so much. What relief. How does that make your mind feel? Real uplifted. And then keeping your five precepts. When you keep your five precepts, what does that do? People feel that you're a trustworthy person, worthy of respect. They know that they can ask you questions, you'll give them an honest answer. I've, in Asia, I was there for 12 years. All the businessmen said, you have to lie or you're not going to be successful. Well, I'm sorry. You have a reputation of being a liar when you lie. Then how can they trust you? Be honest. And that brings respect. The last part of meditation is doing the sitting, but also carrying your meditation with you all the time. You're walking down the street, what are you doing with your mind? Wish somebody happiness, smile. And if nobody's there, wish the birds happiness. They like it. It's learning how to train your mind so that your mind is uplifted all the time. The Buddha talked about there's real advantage. There's great benefit when you do that. 
and you can do it or not. It's up to you. There's nobody that's going to zap you with a bolt of lightning because you screwed up, because you forgot. Well, get up and start over again. Learn from your mistakes. You're going to make them. Everybody does. And it's okay to make mistakes. Just don't repeat the mistakes over and over again. Big thing on the internet right now is the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. That's insane. Okay, I've been talking for a long time. I really have, haven't I? I get carried away sometimes. <laughs> have any questions? I do want you to sit in the morning. Sit in meditation. Not be distracted by somebody else talking. If they start talking, it's okay to get up and go someplace quiet so you can sit. I need you to sit at least six hours a day. Okay? Which is really, I, you have no idea how I've mellowed. When I came back from Asia, I was taking four hours sleep a night. My teacher said, why are you sleeping so much? Cut it down to two hours. Did that for three months. All I did was meditate. And I was meditating oh, 16 or 18 hours in a day. And I'm telling you six. <laughs> and I don't recommend only taking two hours sleep a night. You walk around and you get, you're tired all the time. Lost a lot of weight. It was amazing because uh, I weighed about 200 pounds when I went there. And after this three month stretch, I had to leave the country and I weighed 160 pounds. And I was eating, I have a bowl that I eat out of. I was eating three bowls of rice in the morning. And I would fill that bowl up with food and rice in the afternoon. And I was losing weight left and right. It's not a not a thing that I recommend. It takes a lot of energy to stay up that long. And it takes a while to get used to staying up that long. But the teacher I had at the time was into putting in a lot of effort. And what do I tell you to do? Don't try so hard. Back off. <laughs> But I had to go through the tough experience to find out what was on the other side. And I did that kind of practice. I didn't always uh, sleep for two hours. It was only for three months. Only. When I got, I, I left the country, I was sleeping like you couldn't believe. I'd get up in the morning, I'd go out on alms round, I'd eat my food, and then I'd go, oh, let's, uh, it's about time for a nap. And I'd sleep until five o'clock in the afternoon, and this is when they brought some juice. So I drank the juice and wander around for a little while and go, ah, uh, maybe it's time to go to bed. And it took me six weeks to recuperate so that I felt like a regular person again, not being tired all the time. So I'm not putting you through that kind of experience. I didn't find it useful. 
it was okay to go through it just to see what was on the other side, but I, I would never do that for anybody else. That's no good. The hardest job that I have is teaching people to stop trying so hard and stop being serious. Smile. This is a fun game. Keep it fun. When you get serious, you have an attachment. So let go. Laugh. Okay? Okay, let's hear some merit. <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu.